So just to tell you how tonight's organized, there are eight topics that have been sort of predetermined, and we're going to cover those eight topics in a one-hour time frame by uh, posing a question and assigning somebody to start with it, and then take questions from the floor. But we'll move on quite quickly. That way we'll make sure that within an hour, those who need to leave will have heard most of the content, and those who wish to stay will be able to relax and continue on and take whatever questions we like. I guess I should just say that we are all from different backgrounds, and everybody's going to be giving their candid opinion, and we hope there'll be lots of open discussion. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that we all agree, so we'll see how that goes, but uh, just wanted to make sure that that's clear. It's intended to be an open discussion of various topics tonight. So let me start by introducing, let's see, Terry. Terry's been introduced very well. It's I will good. tell you, I tell my students, she's a dynamo. You just want to be in the same room for a few minutes and let hope some of it rubs off on you a little bit. She's such an inspiration. And as you know, her accomplishments, both personally and in the industry, are very high level. Uh, she gives so much to the industry, and she has earned a reputation beyond what anybody can hope for. I'll leave it at that because we've seen the video. Vic, <laughs> um, if you'll just uh, sure. nod a little bit. I can do that. Oh, okay, thank you. There aren't many financial advisors who have the depth and experience of credentials that uh, Vic has. He's been in the industry for 18 years. He specializes in individually customized insurance and investment strategies for high net worth clients. He contributes heavily to the industry, and that's a theme tonight. These people all contribute very well to the industry and people who are in it, as well as to the community. He lectures, and he is an author. He contributes to a large variety of nonprofit uh, community organizations. And he's the incoming chair of the London Community Foundation on the investment management team responsible for managing $50 million of our money. Uh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Mendy. <laughs> this is Mendy Kamani. He's a CFP, Certified in, uh, Financial Planner. He has 15 years industry experience in senior positions with Standard Life and with ING Wealth Management. Currently, he's a co-owner of an independent Raymond James branch, where he's an investment counselor, uh, focusing on the specialized needs of medical professionals and business people. He also gives generously of his time in the industry and to community organizations, and he founded a charitable event with his children, the Kids Water Climb. And finally, thank you, Mindy, we have Jennifer, <coughs> Jennifer Morrison. Jennifer's been quietly putting together <laughs> solid experience and credentials while being a busy mom and working as a financial advisor. She's worked with Canada Trust, also with MD Management, and I think she's getting her feet wet teaching. Yep. <laughs> so it's good to see her. She's um, holding several designations in the industry already. She's got the certified or Canadian investment manager and her CFP, and she's currently working on the TEP, which is the Trust and Estate Practitioner. So you've got lots of experience in the room, and I'll sit down momentarily, but maybe I'll just introduce the first question. So the first question tonight is, is there a golden rule about some stock or product that everyone should have? Is there something that everyone should have that's that good? And Mendy, maybe you can start with that. Sure, if it's okay, Lynn, I'll just stand up. I'm, we're not planning on using a mic, so it might be easier if we stand up when we're, when we're talking, at least to start off a question. But uh, thanks for that question, Lynn. Uh, and it is a difficult one in that uh, the easy answer is no, there isn't a golden rule in terms of stocks or products that are out there. Um, however, I, I guess it takes a little bit more uh, discussion of that and thought. For us, the number one thing uh, within our practice is looking at risk tolerance. And I, I guess when I look at it, um, there's three things that we're, we're always focused on trying to find out for our clients. One, do you have the willingness to, to take risk? Two, do you have the ability to take risk? And three, do you have a need to take risk? And I think it comes down to that in terms of understanding what product or, or uh, what portfolio is suitable for a client. So if we look at those three things, 
Uh, I think, you know, often we have clients that come to us that have a, a really a, a, a willingness to take on more risk and may even have the ability to take on more risk. But when we do a plan for those clients, we realize that, in fact, they don't need the risk in order to retire with the goals that they've set out for themselves. And so we can carve out a portion of their or a large portion of their retirement and, and allocate assets in a particular way which are less risky perhaps in the way that they're currently allocated, even though they have the willingness and the ability. So one, I think those three points are particularly important when you're looking at the risk tolerance of a client. The second thing is um, that we've learned is that um, uh, risk tolerance is just not a static exercise. It's not something that happens. You, you, you do the exercise once, you figure out what risk tolerance is, and then move on. And so it's, it really is a dynamic thing that's going to be affected by a number of different things. For example, if the, the market should, should correct itself severely as it did in 2008, a lot of the people that we, a lot of our clients that thought, you know, I can handle a lot of risk. Well, sometimes when the market's down 20% or 30%, it, it awakens you to the fact that, well, I thought I could do that because when you showed me the questionnaire, you said, can you live when the markets are down 20%, but they're usually up 40%? Geez, that was an easy question. <laughs> but in reality, when you go through it and you see your portfolio drop that much, it can be a terrifying thing. And so risk can be adjusted because of a market correction. It can be adjusted because of life events as well, and we've seen that quite often. I mean, one of the most relevant one, I think, for a lot of people is when you approach retirement, your risk tolerance will naturally change. And as you actually go from uh, having an income and relying on an income to then being retired and relying on your portfolio, well, as long as I'm working and you see a 10% change in your portfolio, I think it's easy to say, that's okay, I can always work more, not that I want to, but I can work more, I can work more hours, I can work harder, I can save more. But when you're in retirement, that kind of goes away, and so you see that risk tolerance as well change often for our clients in retirement. So I think risk tolerance is critical, and where does that, you know, to get to the point, Lynn, I guess, where does that uh, play into this, um, uh, what is the silver bullet, so to speak? Well, in, in a lot of ways, it's asset allocation, and uh, there isn't one security or one product that's particularly uh, the silver bullet, but if you are properly allocated, uh, there's a lot of studies that show, in fact, Ibbotson has one of the most, uh, widely quoted uh, studies uh, that shows that around 94% of return variability is uh, contributed to by proper asset allocation. So from that perspective, if we know what the risk tolerance is and we allocate a portfolio properly, I think that to me is the silver bullet of making sure that we're helping clients accomplish their financial goals. I'll add one little thing to that, which is taxes. Once you've figured out the asset allocation, in other words, how much I want in bonds, how much I want in equities, how much I want in real estate, and break it up even further between those classes, those asset classes. Uh, the next part is figuring out how to make it tax efficient. And that's a critical component to, to investor returns. And so I, I think, you know, again, I, I don't think there's a silver bullet in terms of this is the stock you have to buy, or this is the mutual fund you have to buy, or this is the product you have to buy. Uh, but on the flip side, I think proper asset allocation is the answer. I'd like to add to that. Anybody? I'd just like to agree maybe with the psychological aspect of, of um, someone's tolerance for risk because if you're looking at someone's time horizon, which is, can everyone hear me? Sorry. <laughs> if you're looking at someone's time horizon, which is another aspect of, of how you want to allocate your assets, your investment assets, say you're going to retire at 65, at 64 you might be planning for 30 years, at 65 you're planning for 29, so you might not think it's much different. But mentally, when you don't have that income, in, in, income coming in anymore, it feels very different. I don't know from personal experience, but I know from speaking to my clients and my parents. <laughs> just, a, just an add-on. Yeah. I'll just kind of throw in a, just to build on what Mendy had said. One of the interesting things that we hear on a regular basis is the water cooler approach to how they want to invest their money. So it's, uh, my friend told me that such and such stock is the best stock or the best fund or the best this, so therefore I want to put my money in that. Or it's time for me to buy a rental property because my friend loves having his rental properties, therefore I want to be <coughs> the next slumlord for UWO and Fanshawe. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting that every single person, as Mandy said, it has a different risk tolerance and a different outlook and what, what do they want to do and what fits them. And, uh, and often the, the advice that you get from the person that's not necessarily designed to or there to, to ask all the right questions um, you can s kind of steer yourself in the wrong way. So it's so critically important that you get all the advice, hear all the opinions, but make sure that the advice you're getting is right for you. 
Can I throw in two cents worth myself? I'm just going to say, one. Of, I've seen a lot of risk questionnaires in my years, and I think they miss one point always. They never ask about how bored you get. No. <laughs> <laughs> they need something to be excited about. They can't stand this boring thing that we do. You know, most of us see people get out of the risk tolerance, but uh, sometimes you need a little slice that's really exciting to focus your energies on and let the rest go. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's all I'll say on that. Uh, our next how many in the room are incorporated in their practice or their business? A few. It seems to be a, a area of more common interest and concern. The, qu the question here is, for people who are incorporated, how have you decided to, on the decision to mix your income between dividends and salary? Have you done a proper assessment, or are you going with rules of thumb? And Vic, maybe you can Sure, to this. we can. So this has become a really interesting <coughs> thing. Like so many of you have already heard, why should you incorporate versus not, and things like that. So we'll skip over all those benefits. But as you know, um, if you've incorporated, you've got the ability now to decide, do you pay yourself a salary or do you pay yourself a dividend? And if you pay yourself a salary, most accountants and most of your tax advisors will generally say, pay yourself $132,000 of salary. And if you need any more than money than past 132000 pay yourself as a dividend. So where does the magic $132,000 come from? It's the magic number for 2013 right now that will create the maximum RSP contribution room for yourself. So depending on your age, your needs for cash flow personally, do you have a spouse, do you have children who are over the age of 18 or coming up to that age, you have the ability to, when you've incorporated, to create what we call pipelines. So we kind of jokingly call it legal money laundering. If you had the ability to pay an 18-year-old approximately, in rounding numbers, $50,000 of dividends from your DPC, your MPC, your holding company, your real estate company, your business, the whatever. But if you have a corporation and you have that ability to pipeline money to an 18-year-old, a 22-year-old, or how about an 82-year-old? Maybe it's mom, maybe it's dad, and they've got minimal or no taxable income, and you can pipeline that money to them, and 30 seconds later, they've gifted the money back to you, and now all of a sudden, we've washed that income very legally through the tax system. So how nice is it if you've got four kids, hypothetically, and a spouse, <laughs> where you've got the ability to potentially draw a couple of hundred thousand dollars of income using a 15.5% tax rate. So that dividend opportunity is there, and you can really maximize it by, again, using those pipelines. But let's suppose you're a single person, you've got absolutely no ability to income split with anybody else, and you're saying, I just want the money for me and I need exactly $132,000 a year to live. So RSP versus salary, dividend, it's all exactly the same, I need 132 grand. In that case, if you took all of your income out as dividends only versus salary, based on 2012 tax planning, there was a 3.4% tax savings. So on about $132,000, you'd save approximately speaking about $3,800 of tax. So dollar for dollar, you'd be ahead. And the more you take out, the more that tax savings kind of exponentially grows. In addition to that, dependent again on age and what your, what your outlook is, you have the ability to opt out of the Canada Pension Plan because CPP earnings are, of course, based on salaried employment. If you have only dividends, then, of course, there's no CPP. So for those of you that are self-employed, you now opt out of the employer portion, the employee portion. That's about another $4,400 of savings. So you take about $4,000 of tax savings on the dividends, you save about another $4,000 and change on the CPP if you choose to opt out of it. Now you've got over $8,000 of savings in the first year. And you compound that out again and again and again and again. Downside when you turn again 63, 65, 70, whatever the magic age will be when uh, CPP rules apply, you won't be collecting the CPP, but the intent is you've saved that money inside your corporation immediately. So tremendous tax benefits to potentially taking that money out and being able to pipeline it and split it and, of course, accumulate it inside the corporation. And now what you've also done is you've given yourself that ability to stream it to yourself when you feel like it. So you can now control how much you want to take out if you're retiring at age 58 years old and you want to now start your own dividend stream, you can do that and, and then get very creative, which is a whole other discussion about creating your holding company, creating a family trust, 
getting money filtered and pipelined through all those different strategies. So it can get very, very creative as you go along. I know uh, about a year ago, Manu Kucker had done a, a talk here on the creative things you can do with your MPC or DPC. Once you've stopped practicing, you deregister and you can do all kinds of fun things. Critically important to kind of talk to your advisor, talk to your tax professional, figure out what's right for you, create these multiple buckets of income. Um, one little caveat is uh, the provincial and federal government is onto this little uh, tax planning uh, loophole. It was never meant to be uh, designed in such a way by CRA that there should be an advantage to taking dividends. It's been that way for a number of years, so for the last approximately 10 years that all of you have incorporated, you've had that planning opportunity. In this past budget that was just launched over here, uh, the federal government has basically started to take that benefit away. So it's our guess right now that that 3.4% tax savings is going to drop to 24 when the provincial government releases its budget. And that gap is going to slowly shrink to the point where there will not be a dividend advantage tax-wise, but there's still the pipeline advantage. So uh, we definitely encourage you to look at it, review it, talk to your advisors and see which one's right for you. I think it's really important that you do talk to your advisor and that you don't just get some sort of standard advice. Because I know, I remember quite a few accountants said, you know, they don't understand it anyway, so I just tell them this. Yeah. So it's worth sitting down and really s figuring out what's best in your situation. Exactly. Okay, well, we'll just, I think my job is to keep us on time. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move along. Um, another topic that has come up a lot is the issue of fees on your investment portfolio and your planning. It's very easy to ignore the fees when things are going well and returns are high. But when returns start to shrink and interest rates are low, suddenly we find ourselves thinking about the fees a little more. So it's important to know how it works. And I'm going to ask um, Jennifer, can mm -hmm. you explain what's involved in mm -hmm. the fee structures that clients are working with? I sure can. Great. Can everybody hear me? My voice doesn't carry as well as some of these men, so. but I'm used to shouting in lecture halls now, so I'm getting better. Um, okay, so as far as investment fees, well, it's, it's tax time. Does everyone know what they pay their accountant? They send you a bill, you write them a check, you know what that costs, right? Um, it's not so simple with your investments. Do you know, does everyone here know what they pay their investment advisor in a year? Some. No. Okay, so I'm just going to take a couple minutes to explain a few of the fees that are inherent in some of your investments. You may be familiar with some, you may not. Um, it's important though as, as educated consumers to understand how your advisors are, be pay are being paid and how much you're paying at the end of the year. You should know that. That's the only way you can know if the advice is worth the cost. So I'm going to start with mutual funds because everybody probably has mutual funds in their portfolio. And I'm going to quickly explain management expense ratios. Everyone's probably familiar with these. I'm just going to lay out the key points quickly for those who aren't. Um, first thing, management expense ratios. All funds have a management expense ratio attached to them. All mutual funds do. Okay? Um, they will vary. How big the fund it, or how large the MER or small is will vary depending on the fund company and the type of fund. So an international equity fund, say, would have a, a lower MER than a Canadian money market fund. It's, it's simply more costly to run an international equity fund. So it would be more expensive. Um, how are they calculated? They're a percentage of assets under management. So they are um, calculated be actually before the um, rate of return is published and before the net asset value per share is published every year. So you, you don't actually see it on your statements. You only see it if you're looking at the prospectus. So you might be blissfully unaware of the MER that you're paying if your advisor isn't uh, talking to you about it, if you're just purchasing, purchasing it yourself and not looking into it. Um, an average MER in Canada is anywhere from 1% to 3%. Can be a bit lower, a bit higher, but most fall in there around 2 to 2.5%. Two and, and what do they cover? Well, they basically cover all the fees of the funds. So uh, there, there are two, two main areas. One, the fund manager, the portfolio manager, has to manage the assets in the fund and the administrative and operating costs of the fund have to be paid for. And second, this is where the, um, your advisor gets paid from, for the advice and hopefully planning services that he or she provides you. It all comes from the MER. Yes? Is that on the book value or the market value? On the market value, correct? Market value. Yes. 
<laughs> okay. Good guess. <laughs> so, any more questions about MERs? That's them in a nutshell. Okay, and there are a couple other funds I just wanted to bring Can up. Can I just interrupt? I just wanted yeah. to make sure that for people that aren't familiar with MERs, they are a cost to you. So if you have a fund that is based on the TSX, the Toronto Stock Index, and the Toronto Stock Index gets 8% in a year and your MER is 2%, you don't get the 8, you get 6. So that's where your cost is, but you don't see it. And in, in many people's world, they look at it and they'll say to me, I got 6%, and they're very happy with that, but know that that did have a cost of 2%. Whether that's good or bad doesn't matter. It's just that th that is a cost, and it's built into the fund. Mm -hmm. You also have to subtract off inflation. Correct. And taxes, and that's a whole other topic of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. So the mutual fund <laughs> makes 8%, and the MER is 2 and inflation is 2 and taxes are 50 percent. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing for you. Yes. <laughs> yes? Uh, could you be <coughs> paying fees twice with the mutual fund in your portfolio? Yes, yeah. you could be. Quite often there'd be a negotiation or a discount on one. They can be layered. Um, there are other funds other than management expense ratios, which is, that's a great segue because I was just about to talk about those. Um, there can be loads associated with funds. You can pay a fee when you buy it. You can pay a fee at redemption, uh, a, a rear end or a back end load that you pay when you sell it. Usually it's set on a sliding scale, so if you hold the fund long enough, you won't pay anything. Um, but those loads can also, or those fees can also be associated with MERs. Um, anything you guys want to add on that, to onto that? To the MERs? No. To the yeah. Or, or they, they can go F class as the other. Yes. Right. Okay. Fee based. Yep. You can. Yeah. You can also go fee based as well. So sometimes <coughs> advisors have the ability to negotiate their portion of the MER. Mm -hmm. These guys would be better suited to talk about that than I would. Mm -hmm. But so there, there is the ability for some advisors, not all, <coughs> to negotiate that part of the fee. Um, there can also be a, an early redemption fee uh, in a mutual fund if you buy and sell it really quickly within a month or something. The fund may charge you a couple percent. That's to inhibit um, active trading. Mutual funds are not meant to be actively traded. It hurts everyone else that's investing in the fund. It's a cost to the fund. They have to hold more money in cash. So you might see a 2% early redemption fee if you buy it and then sell it next week. Um, that covers most of mutual funds. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other way you might be invested, a couple other ways, you might have an investment manager. And in this case, you would get a statement every year and they would charge you a percentage of your assets under management and you would actually see that amount on your statement. Um, this is a little different than management expense ratios in the sense that a portion of it, the portion of it that's called the investment management fee that re represents the advice that you're getting, it can be tax deductible in non-registered accounts. That's something that's important to know. Um, and then the one other most common way that you'd be investing that you'd incur fees would be if you had a full service broker. So if you go to a broker and they buy and sell stocks and bonds for you, you say you're not a mutual fund person. They will charge commissions on all transactions, so both buys and sells. They'll charge a percentage of, uh, of each transaction. Mm -hmm. So those are the main fees I wanted to talk to you about. Um, if anyone has any more questions about fees. I, I just wanted to say I thought it was one of the most important questions that was put on this seminar today because I think that we have a misunderstanding about how, in, how investment advisors are paid. And that's not, a, that's not a negative subject, but I think that too often when fees are, Im are embedded in things, we think things are free or that, okay, the insurance company pays that person, but it's not coming out of my pocket. And it is coming out of your pocket. So it's, it's, relative, it's important to know what those fees are because it matters like one, two, three, four, five percent as to what you're, you're, getting, um, you're getting back. And what, what I see, and, and remember that myself, I don't do money, but I certainly understand it, is when I see especially rear-end loads. Now, rear-end loads can be a good thing, especially if you're an initial advisor, or your initial investor, you don't have a lot of money. Somehow, you have to pay for advice, and the, the addition of rear-end loads to a mutual fund is a way for the advisor to get more money. 
So if a rear end load means that if you buy a mutual fund, if you if you uh, cancel that mutual fund in this surrender charge time, which could be anywhere from one to eight years, you pay a penalty for that. Well, the insurance company or the uh, mutual fund company pays the advisor an extra amount of money if there's a rear end load on the mutual fund. So the investment advisor gets more money with the rear end load. You which could at be at the time of purchase. Right? At the time of okay. purchase, which is perfect if you don't have much of any assets, you couldn't possibly afford to pay for a mutual fund, or sorry, for an advisor, or to get the advice. So if the advisor puts on a rear end load, it's a great thing for you because it gives you free advice and, and hopefully you don't get hurt by that. But if you've got a lot of money in your investments, I don't see that there are very many reasons why you should have a rear end load. They are very costly on you. And the other thing I see out there is there are different kinds of mutual funds, I'll call them. There are mutual funds and there are segregated funds. And segregated funds are like mutual funds, there are some differences in it, but segregated funds charge more, considerably more. And unless you fit the criteria for needing a segregated fund, I wouldn't pay the fee because where it should be is probably about 1% higher to have a segregated fund than a mutual fund. Well, why would anybody want a segregated fund? Well, one of the things is that they are creditor proof. So if you own a business and you're concerned, then perhaps you might want to invest in segregated funds and pay that extra 1% in order to be assured that, that you know, you're going to be protected in the case of bankruptcy. The second reason that people would buy a segregated fund is typically there's a guarantee built into them. So they may say in 10 years time, am I right on that? Mm -hmm. In 10 years time, we guarantee that if the markets go down, we'll give you back 75, 75% to 100%, 100% depending on the fund of your capital. So if you start out at 10,000 and it's 8,000 in 10 years time, well, they'll give you the 10. But the issue is, is that typically the markets don't go that way. So if you're closer to retirement or in retirement, you might want to pay for a segregated fund, especially if you're on the edge financially. You may not want to pay for a segregated fund if you're not close to retirement. So it's not right or wrong, it's the, the circumstances that matter. But I think that the biggest lesson that we can give to people on this one is to have a very candid discussion as to what fees you are paying and make sure you know them and ask about alternative fees. Because if you're paying embedded fees in your mutual fund, maybe it's better that you pay no fees in your mutual fund and that you pay your investment advisor directly and then for the most part, for all unregistered money, that money that you pay the investment advisor is tax deductible. Maybe that's a better choice for you, but not in every case. We might want to come back to this topic, but I'm in charge of keeping us on track. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next topic is concerning past returns. I'm sure you all know when you see an advertisement for an investment product, it always says past returns are not indicative of future returns. And I know my clients always thought, oh yeah, I know, you just have to say that. But really it's true, right? Uh, we want to know, is it really true or do we just say that to protect ourselves? What is the reason for that disclaimer? Are past returns indicative of the future? And I'm going to ask Mandy. Great. Thank you very much, Lynn. <coughs> I guess from, um, well, as you said, uh, it, it's now on a lot of documents that say that past returns are not indicative uh, of future returns. And in fact, I think it's made colloquial by uh, the mutual fund companies. Um, pro package products, mutual funds, if you look at the prospectus, if you look at any of the illustrations or the documents that they're showing in terms of their, their historical returns, they tend to put at the bottom, or always do, in fact, it, it's mandated that they do, that the past performance is not indicative of future performance. And I would go so far as to say that whether or not it's a marketing thing or whether or not it's a, 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 uh, a forced, <coughs> a forced um, statement by the regulators, 
I would go so far as to say it's true. Uh, I, I don't believe that you can ever say that past performance is going to predict future performance. It, does past performance give you an idea of how future performance will do? Yeah, I think if something has done well in the past, if you understand why it's done well in the past, then there is a, a, a good reason to believe that something could perform well in the future, but it certainly doesn't give you the uh, uh, a, a guarantee that that thing will continue to perform exactly the same way. Actually, Terry, if you wouldn't mind yep. uh, flipping to the next slide. This is, I'm sorry, this is gonna be really hard to see. But what it is, is this is, um, uh, I, I, it's basically year by year, starting from 1993 to 2011. Their calendar year returns going down. And if you look at the different colored boxes, what you'll see is that the light blue, for example, is the MSCI EFI, so the uh, Europe, Asia, Far East Index. The uh, color underneath, which is sort of brown, is the S&P TSX Composite Index, so the, the Canadian uh, equity market. Underneath that, you have the MSCI World, so uh, a re reflection of uh, stocks around the world. You have uh, the DEX universe bond is red, so bond, uh, a good, a good ba um, balanced portfolio of bonds or uh, reflective of, of the bond universe. Underneath that you have the, um, I'm having a hard time reading it myself, Citigroup World Government Bond Index, so those would be world government bonds that are issued. Uh, lower you have the S&P 500 in that yellow color and then at the very bottom in that first line in 1993, you have the DEX Canadian 91-day uh, T-bill. And so if somebody said to you, you know, I, I think the best thing to buy, and I'll pick any year here, just arbitrarily look and go, okay, what are we looking at? <coughs> 2002, pick 18.3% as the top performer. That was the MSCI um, uh, EFI, so Europe, Asia, Far East. And you go, well, where was it in 2003? Well, it's at the very bottom. You know, so when you look at this thing, I guess the message that's pretty interesting is can you predict sector performance based on the year before? And if, if anything, I would say predict the complete opposite, right? If you've got something that's done very well, go for the opposite. Now, that's not a very good rule either because, as you can see, that's not always the case. This is Canadian equities, and Canadian equities did well from 2003 to 2010. Um, but then again, in 2011, didn't do very well. In 2012, relatively speaking, didn't do as well, for example, as the U.S. equities, where the Canadian equities up 4% and the U.S. equities up around 13% last year. So, you know, I think the, the idea of can you predict future performance, yeah, there's, there is rigor that goes into that. Um, but does past performance truly tell you what future performance is going to look like? Whether we're talking about mutual funds, packaged products, or whether you're talking about stocks, I mean, we, went, we were talking about tribally, you know, somebody comes in and says, I had a 30% return, uh, my neighbor had a 30% return three years in a row in this particular stock, and I think it's the best thing in, since sliced bread, and I should buy it. Well, is that the right time to buy it? It may be. It may be the right time to look at it, because there may still be good value in there, or a good growth story, and it may still go up, or maybe the absolute worst time to buy it. So looking at historical performance certainly is important, but it isn't the predictor of future returns. I would even go so far as to say, we do a lot of individual securities, and I would go so far as to say, Maybe I could even stretch it, that statement, and say that for a bond, I could tell you that if you had a yield today of 5% on a bond, and, it's an, and we're actually recommending an individual bond, and that bond matures in five years, I can go so far as to say, I can predict with some sort of certitude that yes, it's going to give you 5% over that time frame. But even that is, comes with certain risks. And it's probably the only time I can say past performance to a certain degree is indicative of future performance. But otherwise, I'd say that statement really doesn't hold a lot of water. That past performance does. Yeah. I'll kind of chime in with one quick uh, statement, actually, which is a question that we often all get asked and so forth is when people says, tell me about your past performance as a firm yeah. or as an advisor or, you know, what have you generally done? What have your clients generally done? And, Always the same answer is, well, it depends on the client. We've got clients that are in GICs that are making 2.8% and they're super happy because that's their risk tolerance and so forth. Interesting statistic. 80%, and that's what actually the number is, but 80% of the 6,456 fund managers that are operating right now in Canada will not meet the index. So we call that the couch potato strategy for any of you that... Uh, read up on money sense and so forth, and it's true. 80% of the managers, the fund managers, the portfolio managers, the, the greatest managers in the world, 8 out of 10 of them will not be able to beat the market. The regular plain Jane, 
by the Dow, by the S&P, by the NASDAQ, by the TSX. But there is that 20%, and again, years are years and so forth, but there is 20% that if you look back, Alpha Beta tested it for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. There's, a, there's our managers that have more often than not beaten the market or beaten the indexes, even net of their fee. So it's important when you look at anything and you're measuring pure performance, fees, taxation, all those things, it's important to know that how are you comparing it? Are you comparing it to the right index? Is that, is that the right thing you've compared it to? And you've compared all the costs of acquisition, of sale, of advice, Everything must be apples to apples when you're comparing something. But if we see a portfolio manager, a fund manager that consistently for 20 years has been fourth quartile, bottom of the barrel, and it's typically because the fee is atrocious and the portfolio manager has you know, changed over seven different times, past performance indicates to us that, look, that's probably a bad management team and we're probably not going to be excited about investing any money inside that. But uh, when you hear about the 80-20 rule, it applies to so many different industries and so many different professions, and it's no different in the money management world. But, uh, but always, obviously, strive to try and find that 20%. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is it sometimes <coughs> a risk issue that the fund is not as risky as the market is compared to? For sure. It is. Absolutely. Okay. So you need to pair, compare apples and apples. Maybe if they're capped, say. If yeah. yeah, there's yeah. so many factors yeah. that go into think, it to uh, make it. One of the money managers I'll never forget spoke, and he was talking about people not appreciating the differences in risk. And yeah. he said, and some of you may have heard this person speak, but he said, if you drive home drunk and you make it safe, does that mean it was a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> to and I've never forgotten that. We have to remember to compare similar risks. Yeah. Now, given the confusing stuff out there in the industry, one of the latest, and I, I mentioned Jennifer's uh, working on a designation, the TEP. I had to look it up to see what it is. And I can tell you, it's a great need, the <laughs> Trust and Estate Practitioner. But, Terry, what do all the designations mean? And is it good enough to be licensed? Yeah, I, I want to say that I'm working on my TEP with Jen. We're just <laughs> finishing year two. It's a four-year horrible program. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I've discovered that younger people do better studying than me. But <laughs> anyways, there's a lot of designations out there and there's a lot of licenses and so sometimes it gets confusing for people to understand what they mean. I will say first and foremost that having a license at anything, whether it's insurance, mutual funds, insur uh, securities or whatever, is very basic. It doesn't mean that you know all that much, really. So a license is not enough to understand the qualifications of somebody and their ability to uh, advise appropriately. I will say, though, that the addition of designations, if appropriate designations, does help you determine uh, which type of advisors is probably going to meet your needs more than another. But most importantly, it is experience and recommendations that help determine what is a good advisor for the most part. Now there is alphabet soup out there with regards to designations. Um, there is a designation called the CFP, which I think most of you are, are familiar with. That's Certified Financial Planner. That is a designation that is highly recognized in the financial services market. And it is a international market. And it is a tough designation to get. Um, Mike, how tough is that designation to get? <laughs> it takes at least three years. It takes at least three years. <coughs> and probably four if you think about the Fanshawe years too. It takes a long time to get. You've just, uh, you've just finished it, right? I have one more year of work work one more year. So there's quite a bit of work experience and, and exams and everything else required for the CFP designation. Um, it really does show a, a fairly high degree of understanding of the industry. But there's other designations that I wouldn't say that. For example, both Vic and I took a designation one time called the EPC. Sometimes I'm a little embarrassed to put that on the end of my name because <laughs> it means that it's an elder planning counselor. Now, Vic and I had to take a very tough course uh, for six months in order to get that designation. 
And what, it, and what we had to study was the needs and wants and so on of elderly people. And I thought it was a great course to take, and I've really learned a lot from it. But does it warrant a designation? No, it doesn't warrant a designation. So you get a CFP, which, you know, takes four years and a lot of study and a lot of exams and everything else to get, and you get an EPC, which is, doesn't require very much in designation. So it's important that, that you ask your advisor, you know, what designation, but mainly what experience do you have in the field of financial services, and it's got to be relevant. One of the designations is a CLU. That is a specialty designation in the field of insurance. And it's a tough designation to get. You have to get your CFP and then take extra courses beyond that in order to get the CLU designation. But you wouldn't necessarily want to get it if all you're doing is investment advisor because it doesn't necessarily correspond with that designation. But the designations that Lynn has would be very relevant to extra um, uh, expertise in the, in the investment field. So ask those types of questions on, on, um, on, on uh, designations, but don't depend on the license alone. Well, licensed is better than unlicensed. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie yes. Madoff showed us that. Definitely. <laughs> designations. Yeah. It shows that they have an interest in working towards building their expertise. Oh, I wanted to say, too, if I hear one more person tell me that this advisor, especially investment advisor, is good because they wrote a book, I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, you know, really, if you want to look like an expert, write a book. And, and I, I had this other one. I had somebody call me the other day, and they go, you know, Terry, I just I just want your opinion. I talked to this investment advisor because I read his book. I said, oh, yeah, what, you know, what does the book say? And he says, yeah, you take your money out in April, and then you put it back in in October. Hmm. And that's how you make money. I'm going, really? Sounds like a good vacation plan to me. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, you know, that was the book. And you, it's hard for me to say anything about that, but that's the kind of stuff that is, that is out there. Except if I write a book. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> but, but anyway, Taj, you write a book. I mean, it's important to read it, but take a lot of these things with a grain of salt. Okay, who's heard the common sense warning? If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? But <coughs> if we're not knowledgeable, how do we know if something's really too good to be true or if it's just a really great strategy that we should know about? So I want to know from Vic. That's me. <laughs> Uh, we get these cockamamie ideas uh, <laughs> from all kinds of people who uh, will call or they'll send us an email and they'll say, can you please recommend our tax shelter or our product or our stock or our fund or whatever? And this happens, uh, I would say on every day, uh, we will probably get collectively, uh, I would say probably 20 to 25 emails a day about these harebrained kind of things you can invest in. And it's funny, London, Ontario has been the hotbed for, uh, for people getting themselves into weird, weird investments. Uh, cow in vitro fertilization, uh, the horse <coughs> racing, um, Ponzi schemes, the, the, uh, somebody was having beautiful offices on the top floor of one London place and it was completely fictitious because nobody had a license and on and on and on and on and on. Um, they're the popular ones and the most popular one right now that CRA is all over every Canadian about and they're looking for it. They hired 1,200 new auditors looking specifically when they go through audits for this one particular thing and it's the charitable gift. How would you like to donate $10,000, write a check, 10 grand, and we will give you a tax receipt for 50000 um, or you donate some of your old furniture and a piece of art that was hanging that grandma gave you, and we're going to appraise it, and, oh, that's worth $122,000. <laughs> and we'd like to give you a tax receipt for that. So all that's been going ar around and so forth. CRA caught on to the, the, uh, the quote-unquote bogus, let me create a, 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 my favorite charity and somehow run money through that. Um, and now, of course, people are getting audited uh, all over the place, and CRA is not looking too kindly on that. And if they choose to disallow it, good luck trying to fight that one back uh, the other way. So charitable uh, gifting, um, it's not, not gifting, sorry, the charitable bequest, and, and as it goes along over here, the charitable tax receipt uh, scam, be very, very wary of it. Donating to 
credible, good, worthwhile causes, phenomenal. Uh, but be, uh, of course, worry of anytime you're doing it purely for the reason that I'm giving you this much and you're going to be a tax receipt for this much, that's a big giant red flag out there. Uh, the too good to be true as it relates to I'm going to give you a 17% guaranteed rate of return every year for the next 10 years. You're probably going to want to ask some more questions rather than just <laughs> sign up for that. Right? You might want to show it to not only your personal investment advisor, you might show it to your lawyer, you might show it to your accountant, you might ask others' opinions and so forth. Read the prospectus, you know, ask deep questions beyond, wow, that sounds amazing. Um, and again, if it smells funny, not to say it always is funny, but if it is, you've got to ask a lot more questions. And if it's, uh, if it's not something that you're at all familiar with, which uh, most people, again, you, a prospectus, if none of you have ever read a prospectus, it's usually about, uh, depending on the thing, anywhere from 12 to uh, about 488 pages <laughs> sometimes. And it's been written by some wonderful lawyers that have completely <laughs> covered the butt of anybody that you're investing with. But inside that, it has pretty much everything that you need to know. So we encourage you, if you don't understand something, by law, every single advisor has to give you a prospectus, whatever you invest in. It could be a fund. It could be um, a segregated fund, uh, whatever it is and so forth. Read up on whatever you're going to put your money into uh, because uh, there are amazing, credible, wonderful ways to invest your money. Uh, but if it smells kind of funny, then ask more questions. That's a cool question. What, what, about, what about the, the guys on the radio as uh, uh, guaranteeing eight percent to the guy's mother and, gra and mother-in-law and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah. I haven't heard that ad in a while. Eight <laughs> <laughs> percent of your own money back. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, it. Fluffy, high level, and well, it just works that way. <laughs> I haven't made the call. Not necessarily <laughs> a particular company. Not saying that that's what I'm talking about, but just uh, how, how do you guarantee that is usually the best question to ask them? One of the most purchased investments over the last about six years, actually, in in North America and definitely in Canada, has been something called the the it's called the GMWB, the Guaranteed Minimum Withdrawal Benefit. And some people will market in many different ways, income plus, we're going to guarantee you a 5% rate of return until the day you die, all those things like that. And 9 out of 10 Canadians that have put money into that particular kind of a contract have no idea how it works. All they understand is it's supposed to pay me 5% every year and my GIC will pay me 2.8, so sign me up for the 5 and it sounds amazing. And we're not... Today is not a bashing day to say it's a good or bad product and so forth, but again, the, the key point is 9 out of 10 Canadians that have put money into this, and I'm talking about in the billions, the tens of billions of dollars have gone into that particular financial instrument for the last seven years, and they have no clue how it works. So again, if you're looking at that because you've heard about it and it's very, very, very popular all across the country, we're saying really, really, really understand and ask the questions of the person that might be recommending that product. How does it work? How do I get my 5%? How can I get my money if I need to get my money out of it tomorrow? Is there a back end load to it? All those different things. But um, certainly, as I said, when 9 out of 10 people who have purchased it couldn't tell you in under two minutes how it works, then red flag. I want to know if you think their advisors could tell them. I would, I would suggest that 8 out of 10 don't know how no. they work either. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I, 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 have uh, one second? Yeah. I just want to say a couple of things. I guess one, um, we've all heard the expression too, if, if all you have is a hammer, then everything you see is, I guess, a nail, something along those lines. Lynn, correct me on how that should be well said. <laughs> but, but it's true in, in financial advice as well. If, if all you sell is one thing, then that is the only thing that applies to everyone. But one of the things that we're trying to get across today is there isn't a cookie cutter answer and there is no, there really isn't a, a, a silver bullet or, or the perfect answer for everyone. And so I think one of the good things to ask too is what else do you recommend? And if the only thing that that person recommends is that very thing, then you know that there is a bias and it probably is the only thing that they're doing for everyone. And that's never the right answer. The other thing I'd say is don't come too late if, you know, uh, we, we have clients and we have wonderful, wonderful clients 
But my least favorite call, and it doesn't happen very often, is the call where I've done something. Because it's too late often. It's hard to unwind something that's been done. Most of our clients know, call us before you make any big financial decisions. And I would say if you've got a trusted advisor, whether it's an accountant, a lawyer, your financial advisor, an insurance agent, whatever, whoever it is that you trust, go to them before you make the decision. Don't go to them after. It's often too late. I think we should come back to that. But okay. I'm failing in my task here. We have two <laughs> more questions. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about tonight is insurance. People often heard don't buy insurance as an investment. Insurance is a risk management product. But a lot of people are buying insurance for other purposes these days. And Terry, you're the expert. I want to know, is there a time when it makes sense for something other than straight net risk management? Okay, so quite often when we're looking at insurance, your advisor is saying, what are your debts? Um, in the event of your death, what kind of income flow has to go to the family? That's called risk management. There comes a point in your, ta in your life where risk management may not be important, and in fact, you don't need life insurance. But still, life insurance can be a very good opportunity for you. Why? Because life insurance offers two unique tax advantages that can't be found in any other investment. One is that the death benefit is tax free. The second thing is that the tax, or sorry, the cash accumulation within a life insurance policy accumulates on a tax free basis or a tax sheltered basis. So if you don't need life insurance for risk protection, sometimes providing that you've done, a, you've got a lot of money in your RSP and providing that you've, you know, put money into your TFSAs and you've got some corporate money and you're saving money and things are good, sometimes life insurance provides a fabulous other vehicle in order to save money to either supplement retirement income or pass money from one generation to the next. So if it's likely that your money will outlive you, well, you can keep it in your corporation and upon your death, everything will be taxed. It's taxed a couple of times and then it passes out to the next generation. But if you know that some of your money is, you know, it's going to pass to the next generation and you put premium dollar into a life policy, the death benefit flows into your corporation or flows to you to your estate tax free and then passes on to the next generation totally tax free. So it allows for a bigger estate to go to the next generation. If you're so inclined that you would like to leave a legacy, life insurance allows you to provide a bigger charitable contribution to your favorite charity or charities than just actually passing cash in many instances. So insurance is a great financial strategy. But the thing is, is that it has to be appropriate. So does it make sense necessarily that 100% of your savings go into a life insurance vehicle in order to save for retirement? I would question that kind of analysis, but certainly there's a place in the estate plan for it. Um, so when you're looking at it, it has to fit your your, your risk tolerance, what you've already got in place, and um, it has to fit what it is you want to do. So you want to ensure that the investment advisor or the insurance advisor knows what your assets are like and that you know this can form a reasonable part of your portfolio. Now the thing is, is that what sometimes happens is, is that they're called different things. Instead of calling it life insurance, you may say, well, you know, what we're going to talk today about is an enhanced retirement plan. And so you're talking about enhanced retirement plan, and the person involved may not realize that enhanced retirement plan means life insurance. If you have to fill out an application and medical questions are asked, it is a life insurance policy. If not, it's an investment. So I, I give you that thought process, and going back to what Mendy and Vic said, when you're looking at those big kinds of programs, whether it's life insurance or charitable tax things and so on, you've got a wealth of advisors that are out there, your investment advisor, insurance advisor, and accountant, and I urge you, if it is a large investment especially, whether it's life insurance or anything else, it's a good idea to have a conversation with your other advisors to ensure that what you are doing makes sense within the total realm of uh, your financial well-being. 
but I just wanted to show you why we would even think about life insurance as being a non-risk issue. So I've given an example that's purely arbitrary. I've got a 42-year-old and this person has got a massive inheritance and he does not need any money at all. So the family would be well protected in the event of his death, no problem. But he's looking at taking a policy that's worth $45,000 a year, so he's saving $45,000 a year. He puts it into a policy for 15 years and what, uh, what he's doing is he's looking at this money as a fixed income type of investment. So what I've done in this scenario is compared putting money into a life insurance policy, a permanent life insurance policy, to an investment at 4%. So what does it look like? Well, let's supposing that this person at age 80, between age 80 and 90, wants to actually take the cash value of that policy out and use that as a retirement income. How does that compare with an investment and drawing money out of an investment over that period of time? Well, the bottom line is, is that out of the insurance, you can get $2.3 million of investment or income during that, those 10 years versus a million two out of a straight investment and with insurance, you still have another, what, one, $1 million of insurance left over. So the point is, is that if you're talking about retirement, insurance makes good sense, but does it mean you put everything into it? The answer is no. But it certainly does make sense for a portion of your portfolio. If you don't need retirement income, how does the death benefit compare? It's a very easy scenario to compare. So you know if you die at age 80, life insurance can provide $3.6 million of death benefit, where an investment is a $1 million in death benefit. So if you know your money's going to outlive you, you might as well pass it through insurance and get it uh, tax-free to the next generation. And probably the ratio is about three times to one on doing it uh, compared to a, a traditional investment. So insurance makes it sense when you don't need insurance as an estate, and, and uh, as an estate purpose or to enhance retirement, but certainly it represents one component of many in retirement savings. So Terry's highlighting the importance of putting this into the big picture. And our last question kind of comes to this. A lot of people will turn to others that they think are knowledgeable in financial matters before they make decisions, but they don't tell those others anything about their own circumstances. So they'll talk to their mom, their dad, their son, their daughter, their neighbor, their mailman, but they won't tell them anything about their own finances as they get advice from these people. And I think that is the key to when we talk about an advisor, it's someone who's knowledgeable and who knows your situation. And Jennifer, why do we need one? Oh, well, that was a beautiful segue because that's true. <laughs> you need to disclose your information to your advisor or they're not going to give you sound advice. Um, I hope the evening has summed up mostly why we need advisors, but um, there are a couple things I wanted to mention. First of all, I didn't bring statistics, but I'll ask you to feel free to Google this if you want to when you leave. Studies consistently show that investors, um, just individuals who work closely with an advisor, end up having higher net worth and report a lot less stress and anxiety relating to their finances throughout their life, their working life and their retirement. Um, it, pays, it pays off. Studies show consistently that it does. I can tell you from personal experience as a financial planner, um, it's equally as important not only to have a good advisor in each area, investment, tax, legal, uh, insurance, but that they are, have an integrated approach in that they don't have to work for the same company, but that they are willing to speak to each other. In my role here, I see people's uh, investment statements. Sometimes people like to have a couple different investment advisors. That can be fine. I see their accounting statements. I sometimes see their wills. And I can instantly tell if there's someone quarterbacking this whole thing. Uh, you see investments uh, that should be in tax sheltered things and the non registered, and they're all over the place. You can tell if someone's looking at it from the top down instantly. And you can instantly save these people so much money by just making some minor adjustments and having an integrated plan put together. Um, any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go on because no <laughs> we're over time. Um, I was going to show you quick, just as an example, I'm not going to show you a full financial plan. I'm going to show you a really quick retirement analysis and how it might help and how we might, this is something I would do for a client and how it would integrate with other uh, advisors. Um, 
just a simple uh, scenario, Bill and Mary are in their early to mid-40s. Um, they want to retire at about 60. So you can see they've got you know, 350,000 now. Um, a lot of it's in their house. If we flip to the next page, this is a neat little analysis we can do. It doesn't take much time. Is that it? No, next yeah. one. It'll give them the... Sorry, the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing so well. <laughs> no. Next one. Thank that you. One. So if you can read this, I can't read it from the side. Can you guys read that? Sorry. It basically Long gives them their retirement yeah, options. It. Uh, it tells them, you know, how much more they need to save to get where they want to be. Um, Mendy mentioned something in the first question about what kind of rate of return you want or need when you're talking about your, your tolerance for risk. Well, how many know what rate of return they need? You might know what you want, you might want 20, but how do you know what you need? If you do something like this, you can take this to your investment advisor, which is what I would highly re recommend to someone I prepared a plan, f plan for, and I would say, we just assumed for the sake of an assumption that you were going to earn 5%. According to this, you need to be getting about 5.8% to get where you want to be at age 60. So take that to your investment advisor and then have an educated discussion on, on how you should be investing your money. Um, things like that, they all need to be talking to each other. If your advisor won't talk to any of your other advisors, if they're too protective, that would worry me a little bit. <laughs> they should be open, okay? All right. I'll just echo what Jen says in terms of integration of advice. I don't, I think it is extremely, extremely, extremely important that every component of what you do works together. And if there is no integration, um, one of the challenges is you can often do something over here that is not complementary to what you're doing on the left side. And you can end up losing a lot of time, money, energy trying to work through those things if there is an integration. So, I mean, it, it is critical that that integration occurs between your professionals. Mm -hmm. I'll just kind of chime into one other point. I mean, all evening right now, we've kind of talked about, you know, fees and performance and advice and scams and all those things like that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, as a consumer and as an investor and as somebody who's building a financial portfolio, uh, our advice to you collectively would be don't just seek out the highest performance or the lowest fee or the greatest idea that you've heard since whenever, it, it's about a comfort level. And you know, you'll meet many different lawyers, accountants, financial advisors, insurance brokers, whoever, and really ultimately you're trying to, your job, and it's the tough job, is to try and assemble a team around you that's partnering with you. And if those people take that approach that they are your financial partner as you kind of go through your life and and do all those steps as you grow through uh, through the years and things like that, that's ultimately the best advisor for you. And it has nothing to do with the fee they charged you or um, necessarily the greatest product that they recommended. It's about the complete and total, we call it the value proposition that you got and you've mutually received from each other in that relationship. Yeah. I can throw in my two cents worth. Uh, since I came into the industry in 1984, I hope I won't offend anybody by saying this, but if anyone had called me a financial planner at that time, I would have been very offended. It wasn't a profession. A financial planner at that time was somebody who probably hadn't finished high school selling mutual funds. Certainly not an advisor the way that we see it. So in the nearly 30 years since then, are we the same age, Terry? Yeah. <laughs> In the nearly 30 years since then, what we've seen is, first of all, things have become far more complex than they were, far more complex. And, you know, when we used in the 80s, you know, you got simple advice from dad, you know, save 10% of your money. That was all you really needed to know, but it's not like that anymore. So we have kind of created, like many things in our world, the need for people who are qualified, who take an interest and are prepared to do the work, to, to have the big picture. And I'm so aware, having left the industry as a practitioner, I'm so aware of the advice that people who aren't qualified give. And none of them think to say, you should go see a planner. Because <laughs> we just haven't really integrated that idea that there are advisors, they are accessible. And most of you know one, obviously. In this room you know one. But most people do know one, but they just don't think of it to say you should really go and see somebody and talk about this. That's all I really wanted to say. There's actually, sorry, can I say one more thing? I'll be quick. 
the flip, the other side of the coin too is that the actual advice is tangible. Maybe you can measure the dollars they saved you. I don't want anyone to underlook, under value, <laughs> the, uh, the ability for a planner or advisor to motivate you to act. That's well, well and good if you get a plan or a piece of advice or you think you, and you know you should do something, but if you have someone hounding you to do it, that's the only way it's actually going to be beneficial to you. So if, if any of, of us up here are pushy at times, it's because we need to be to get you to act because that's the only way it's going to be worth anything. So there's the behavioral side of it as well. <laughs>